So, I have this super cool friend named Sophia Bates, who's awesome and beautiful and amazing and totally badass. Seriously, this chick is badass. About five years ago, she gave me these seeds for my birthday, and they are from Montenegro, and they are tree collared seeds. That's what's growing behind me. In Montenegro, they're called Rashkan. This is also known as tree kale sometimes, tree cabbage, walking stick kale. It's basically the same plant as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, collards. All of those are the same plant. They're just bred in different directions so drastically and for so long that they appear completely different, but they're actually the same species. So as far as I know, this is the same species as all of those, but this is bred to grow perennially Year after year, it just gets forms these big, tall stalks, and you just keep picking and eating the leaves, and they just grow continuously all year long. They will not grow in very extremely cold climates, but there are a lot of places they will grow. They tolerate a good hard freeze, but at some point there's a limit and they'll freeze out. We already grow these here. They're grown from cuttings, and the ones that grow here, the purple tree collard, rarely go to seed. So uh, every once in a while they'll form some seed, but usually very, very hesitantly. Often they'll flower, but they won't actually produce any seed. If they do, they're often crossing out with, you know, broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and stuff like that. So the leaves are rather thick and heavy and tough. They're very, very substantial. I think they're very nutritious. Chickens love them. Even when they have other good stuff to eat, they'll often peck at those anyway. They have a real strong cabbage -y type of flavor. So some people don't like that. They put the rough and roughage. They are heavy, strongly flavored leaves. Sophia says that in Montenegro they use this as a staple. She said all over the homestead in every nook and cranny where there was a little extra space there'd be these Rashtan plants growing. And they would cook them most of the day and cook them with salt pork and onions and then eat them over the top of, uh, you know, like boiled potatoes or something like that. Anyway, I planted some of those seeds in 2014, and now it's 2018. My purpose was to plant a whole bunch of them, grow them out, and see which ones did or didn't go to seed. Because to me, one of the coolest things about tree collards is that they don't go to seed. Now, what I noticed right away is that the plant seemed more vigorous than the tree collard that we traditionally grow, and I thought that was really interesting because Sometimes plants that are propagated vegetatively pick up diseases and virus that can eventually cause them to be weak and grow, grow weakly and poorly. So I thought, well, maybe that's the case with these, you know, maybe because they've been propagated, you know, who knows? The cuttings that I have maybe go back a hundred years. I mean, I have no idea. They're just propagated by cuttings and they rarely go to seed. I thought, okay, well, maybe we can, you know, get some new varieties of tree collars out of these seeds that are resistant to bolting. So I've been growing these here now for four years. This is the fourth growing season. The third growing season, a bunch of them flowered and this year even more flowering. And I have one plant that I'm excited about. It's one of the largest plants. It's got a really uh, huge deep purple leaves. It's tall, it's straight, and it hasn't flowered yet. I'm gonna pull a bunch of them out and then I'm gonna plant more seed today, if this seed will grow, because like I said, it could be maybe six years old or more at this point, five or six years old. So I'm gonna do that, and then I'm gonna tear out most of these, and I'm gonna replant them with new seedlings and do the same thing. I have not watered these beds for three years, uh, two or three years. Before that, I didn't do much. I have hardly fertilized them. This is California. We're talking about five or six months of completely dry weather with super hot sun, baking temperatures. I barely lost any plants. These things are super tough. Now, if you want them to produce really good, you know, leaves, edible leaves, and a lot of them, and large leaves, and tasty leaves in the summer, you're not going to be able to treat them that way. But then again, if you had huge amounts of them just spread all over your homestead, then maybe you could get away with it if you didn't mind eating, you know, tougher, stronger flavored leaves and having a lower production. My point though is two things. One is they're, they're definitely survivors. They're extremely tough, surprisingly so. And the other is that this one plant that I'm, I'm singling out has managed to grow large and healthy and 
not go to flower even under this tremendous stress. Stress generally can induce flowering because the plant's like, uh-oh, I'm gonna die, I better reproduce now, or my genes are gonna, you know. I haven't weeded this hardly for, you know, a couple of years. I'm just gonna get the plants established and let them grow and see what survives. Some people commented on my um, apple breeding video that it might be good that I was not taking very good care of the seedlings because then the weak ones will die. But there's other reasons that I don't want to do that in, in those rows and that would require a whole video. But just suffice to say that, oh yeah, I definitely use selection pressure. I use it to select varieties to grow and I use it in uh, seedlings and any kind of breeding because I'm a flaky gardener. I barely take care of stuff. A lot of times I don't. I won't be surprised if I grow out these seedlings in the greenhouse and no, don't even plant them or if I plant them and then they die. Trust me, these are gonna be under heavy, heavy selection pressure and that's good. In this case, I think it's good. So I'm gonna run through here and clean this up. I'm gonna pull some of the plants out that I don't want. Not very many right now, we'll do that later. Then I'm gonna show you the one that I like and I'm going to tell you why I like it and if that keeps behaving we're going to turn it into a named variety and I'll have those available eventually in the next few years. I'll start to propagate them and try to get enough cuttings. Then I'm going to go in the greenhouse and I'm going to plant the seeds that I have left here or at least some of them to grow a new batch and uh, that's it for now. All right, as you can see, these are pretty substantial and you can see why it's called walking stick kale. I make biochar out of them or for your compost, chop them up and put them in there. So one more thing on growing these from seeds versus cuttings, I think it's probably a good idea that we do both. Like I said, it seemed to me that these plants were more vigorous and healthy. So the advantage to having seed available is that we could maybe refresh, we could breed with them, improve them and stuff like that, which is what I'm trying to do. The advantage of cuttings is that we're getting exactly the same thing. There's a high degree of genetic variation in this population in terms of color, size, behavior, flowering behavior, and all that stuff. So that's why I'm kind of obsessed with finding some that are resistant to flowering, that are worth propagating. And I think it'll still be easy to get the seed from those once, you know, if we want to, we could figure out how to stress the plants and cause them to flower more readily. Okay, so let's take a look at the one that I like here. Okay, here it is. This is my favorite one. It doesn't look that good because the top is all chewed up by birds. Birds love this stuff. But look at these huge and beautifully colored leaves. This is like just royal purple, amazing color. And again, in spite of neglect and just being put through really harsh conditions, this plant has performed admirably. It's thick, it's straight, it has large leaves and it hasn't flowered even under tremendous stress. So the next step with this, again, I'm gonna wait three or four weeks to make sure it's not gonna flower, then I'll just cut it off and it'll start to grow new shoots. You see all these shoots? Then those will grow more and I'll be able to pull those shoots off, root them. I probably planted 30 to 35 of these and this is the one. This is the one that's performed the best. This is exactly what I was looking for and pretty much what I expected was a low percentage of you know plants that I'm going to want to select out. Okay, this is a collection of leaves. I went around and picked some leaves for lunch and you know, I'm picking like the best leaves to eat. Some are large, some are not. But yeah, this is the best leaves from all of the other plants. There must be 15 or more other plants. And these are the leaves from that variety and I wasn't actually you know I'm not going around trying to find the very biggest nicest leaves of everything to compare this is just what I picked for lunch and you can see the difference this is why we vegetatively propagate stuff because if I plant a seed population of this I now know that I'm going to get 30 or 35 plants that perform anywhere from poor to mediocre and one plant that performs like this so what is like maybe 30 to 1 and if I plant this vegetatively propagated and I plant 30 of these, I have 30 high performing plants. Big, big difference. And look at this color. Gorgeous. Now this one here has the best color. It's almost no green, just very little green on the top maybe. 
but it's a total runt. If I keep growing these out by seed, I may end up with something this color that's huge. Now there I have a marketable variety that people are going to be excited about, and I'm going to be excited about and want to grow. Multiple seeds in each hole, about three, because these seeds are very old. I prefer to grow the entire population. I mean, all the seeds and grow a huge quantity, that would be the way to do this, but I just can't do that. When I have more money, when I have garden and orchard managers, this is what I need to do what I want to do. Get some water systems put in, get people to manage these projects, because I can't manage them all. And then we could grow out, you know, there's a thousand. I've had a thousand of these seeds. There may still be five to eight hundred left 